Hi everyone, I'm Mary Beth McAndrews. I am a film critic and culture writer. Um, I am here to conduct some of the Q and A's for the unnamed footage festival this year, uh, kind of adding a more critical perspective to the self-deprecating tone. Uh, today, I'm here with Jillian, Hor Jillian Wallace Horvat. She is the director of I Blame Society. Hi, Jillian. Hi, nice to so see everyone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Online film festivals are really weird. It's, you feel like after like a while you get used to it, but it's still it's still bizarre. Yep, it's weird. <laughs> um, okay, so I blame society. How many weird search searches are in your search history now for <laughs> looking up how to do tie these knots and how to be a serial killer from the movie? <laughs> Um, I think they're all in Chase's history, um, and he just sent me <laughs> links. So I did that very smart. Very smart. Um, so the first, the first actual question I want to ask you about I Bloom Society is, why did you want to do this, this footage, this film in like that kind of pseudo documentary found footage format? Um, because it was built off of a unfinished short documentary that I was working on already. So um, if I was going to use that footage, then I would have to keep the film going in that kind of format and tone and I would have to continue to um, play myself on screen. So that footage um, is used in the film and um, it's what you see on the laptop when they're when uh, she and Keith are are watching her project together, and mm. so that was kind of the um, the genesis and the the seed of, of the of the film, and um, and I built it out from there. Cool. And did you actually get the compliment that you look like you'd be a good murderer? Um, not that I would look like that I, I would be, oh, you a, good would be, a, be yeah. a good murderer. Yeah. Did you actually receive that compliment? Yes. Or I don't know compliments the right word for it. Um, I think it's a compliment. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, and so something that's really cool about this movie is it's a female serial killer and a lot of serial killers are male, or at least that's what we see in media. So what was it like constructing a female serial killer when all we really see are male? I mean, I, I didn't really um, consider it from that point of view too much because mm -hmm. I was just kind of building it off of what it would be like for um, uh, somebody like me and somebody who is a filmmaker to end up um, becoming a, um, a murderer and, um, and building it from there. And because I, I don't, I've never felt like a, a super feminine person or, or any of those things. Um, I don't feel totally, um, I've never felt really gendered in that sense, you know? Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't think about it. And it's not like I'm mm. kind of a, an, it's not like I'm a person who identifies as, as non-binary or a person who, um, you know, identifies themselves as being on a gender spectrum. It's more just like, my subjectivity is doesn't think that way okay cool that makes well and like I like that about the movie especially I mean there is a lot of discussion about like wanting women to be there for diversity purposes and to like be that strong female lead um and so it was especially from like a found footage perspective and how there aren't a lot of female perspectives in the genre slash using the technique but something else I really enjoyed about the movie was how you injected female sexuality into it because a lot of found footage movies are a lot about like guys being creepy on camera or hiding the camera but in this film you hide the camera and mm -hmm. so which I thought you know it's it's creepy but I also like the idea that women also have sexuality so I want or like sexuality is not just like a male thing so I wanted to hear more about the construction of sexuality and why you wanted to use that in the film well it was it was awkward for me um writing the film and and and, and directing it and acting it in it and then positing myself as a, a sexual being and a sex mm -hmm. object as well as a desiring subject all of those things were complicated it felt I felt 
like a narcissist to, <laughs> to, to put myself in that, um, in that position. So I really actually looked a lot to my co-writer Chase to help mm -hmm. me with those moments. Um, he was actually the first person who wrote um, a, a sexual interaction for my character. And that made me feel liberated to, to, to be that per, to be that character because it wasn't me who was doing it. I didn't feel like, um, like an egotist, you know? Yeah. Oh no. That's, that's gotta be very, a very awkward experience writing a sex scene for yourself. I don't think I've ever thought about that before and having to like write yourself as a sexual object. I mean, it was, um, the great thing about it was that I, I didn't look at it too personally in, in that sense, but I was like, what, what do I want to see on screen that I don't see enough of? What is going to work that is going to really creep people out, but it will be like, it, what, will, what will be intense, you know? Yeah. And so speaking of intense, what was it like playing yourself, but playing yourself to the extreme? Like what was, was it hard to kind of step back from that after filming? And like, what was that kind of mental process for you? I think it was, it was dissociating, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. it was definitely all dissociating to, to play somebody having a breakdown while you're under a lot of stress and people are looking at you in a authority position and, uh, you know, to have your shit together. So I didn't feel like I could show really any vulnerability on set, except really to like to chase and, you know, um, a few people. I really had to overcompensate to hold it together and seem, um, you know, very untouched by everything because if the lines blurred too much between what I was playing and, and what I was, um, and how I was acting, I was worried that I would, uh, people would start to get worried. Ah, uh, <laughs> cause I mean, there is like this huge blurring of boundaries between reality and the, her breakdown. And that makes sense in terms of like, you don't want people to actually think you are also suffering that breakdown. And what I actually, what I was also really great about your character in the movie was how somewhat subtle, but kind of very gradual. Like there isn't a moment where you really snap. And I like that kind of more gradual, like the way that you kind of start smiling and giggling more. And like, when you call, <laughs> you call um, Keith a cunt in the, in the coffee shop. Um, so I was just wondering again, like what was that process of, of um, sculpting your character and portraying that kind of mental breakdown and transformation without it being like super obvious? Well, to me, I did kind of have a, a demarcation line where, you know, I saw my character as just somebody who was very depressed um, mm -hmm. and feeling underestimated, um, you know, getting continually disappointed throughout the film up to the point where, you know, she goes on the hike with Chase. She thinks everything's going to turn around, at least, you know, like here's one person who's always liked the shit that she's done, who's believed in her and like was her best friend. And then that ends up being a disappointment. And then even worse, you know, she sees him die right in front of her, whether she, you know, played a, an, an active or just too much of a Brinksman role in that, you know, is, is up for debate. But, you know, I think the sight of that and that that huge crushing disappointment is really, is to, was to me the point where I broke um the yeah. character and and changed it into a much more mannered performance from then on where I really kind of wanted to show somebody kind of um uh, disappearing and wasting away and kind of um becoming a creature um mm -hmm. even as she even as she is more empowered and active and violent you know she's not She's not who she was anymore. You know, she's yeah. Different. And so going from there about like the representations of like female rage or just rage in general and women kind of getting revenge, not just on one person, but on society, was it, 
liberating for you to kind of be able to portray that rage in such kind of like a violent slash not really typical normative way? I mean, that was hard for me because it's not, it's not anything that I connect with. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel a lot of like anger and fury and rage inside, um, but I don't ever act on it. I, yeah. I'm more of like have a, a dry and, and, and pithy way of, you know, putting my feelings. I'm, you know, I'm articulate, so I don't need to rage too much. So that was really hard for me. I, cause I, I don't, I haven't like, I haven't yelled much in my life. I can like count it on, on one hand. And that's why I think my yelling is so awkward in the movie. I really like yell pretty awkwardly, but I think it actually works for the character. Cause she's basically me. And that's, that's, that's me. I can't, I can't yell very well. I've gotten better. I've gotten better at it actually since, since the movie, um, been able to channel that a little bit more, but like, that was hard. And I think it, you know, it's not necessarily that like, as a woman, I've been socially conditioned to not show conflict because that's, I, I've definitely gotten the message and people have told me that, but I'm never, I never take it. I'm a very, I'm not <laughs> conflict averse. I am confrontational in a, in a really positive way. I'm very like transparent and direct. Um, but I've never had a problem, you know, um, saying what I feel and, and acting on it in that sense. But, but the rage and the violence, you know, th those were difficult things. And those were also the things that were just hard from, an actor standpoint on top of everything that was going on to be like, I don't know how you stab somebody and make it look real. I don't know. I've never <laughs> stabbed anybody. I don't even like cut meat because I don't really eat red meat. So I'm not, I'm not used to carving anything. Like, I just don't know how this feels or how it's supposed to look. But oh, sorry. You know, <laughs> after enough takes and looking at it and being like, well, how does this look? Okay. Maybe this isn't how it looks in real life, but how does it look in a movie? I think we've figured it out enough. Yeah. I was going to say it looks pretty, I mean, and also the smashing in his head with the skateboard was pretty, was pretty awesome. That, <laughs> and, uh, was that, or, that, yeah. felt, that felt good. <laughs> so were you a found footage fan before making this film or like a pseudo documentary fan? I think, you know, I love when it, I love when it works and I, I love, uh, it's so brilliant when it does uh, because it of those blurring uh, lines between narrative and uh, non-narrative, you know, the yeah. hybrid and then the, you know, I love that kind of the playing and the meta textuality. But I also think that there's um, a lot of cheating within the genre of, um, you know, cheating with cameras and with looks and with what angles and plausibility, I think that um, people aren't hard enough on themselves when they're doing it. They really, you know, like, they're like, well, you know, if they're paying attention to that, you know, then they're not, you know, really getting into the story. It's like, how can I get into the story if you're just flaunting this in my face that you're not putting this together in a way that's cohesive and coherent and, and you know, within the, within the world? So I think that it's, it's not that difficult. It, it means like certainly having to sacrifice some flash and in to do it authentically. I think it's much better to be authentic and to operate within the medium with verisimilitude rather than to make it look glossier and then you look stupid. Well, and that's what I like, like you have, the GoPro on your head. And then you have like your selfie stick and you're always like, Hey, can I set up the B camera? And I love that. Cause it is very authentic. Like, Hey, I'm not gonna, you really do acknowledge the presence of the camera, which is a big part of think of found yeah, footage. People would notice it and they notice when you're filming them and they're like, are you filming me? Like, you know, we had, it just had to be real. Yeah, exactly. And like, you know, with the B camera, you know, angles change in found footage, but you saying this is the B camera. It was so good. Cause you're like, I'm not going to have one angle. Like I'm going to have multiple angles. And then you have like, you're setting up lights and everything. Like you very much show that process, which I think is great, especially in kind of found footage of that meta textuality. So did you film most of it yourself? Like was most of that done by you with like the cell phone and GoPro footage? 
you can't you can't because yeah. somebody, <laughs> you would, somebody would vomit if they saw it on on a big screen or, or you know I was willing to operate as best I could but our DP was like you just can't like people would will get nauseous so <laughs> Um, because if I had it on my head and I'm talking, I move my head naturally, I would be losing people, um, in the frame. I would, it would just be, it would be nauseating. So, yeah. um, so we had to, you know, like, like a movie, you know, we reset for the close up, and Olivia is just holding this camera on top of my head like this while I'm acting. So that's what, if you look at the reaction shots to the GoPros, they're reacting to me talking to them and, you know, another woman like holding a camera in front of my head, you know? That's amazing. <laughs> just, you know, behind the scenes, just her holding it like that. Um, and so my last question for you really is just, um, what are your, some of your favorite found footage movies? Um... I should have come in prepared for that question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, you know, okay. So, well, actually the, the one that in, really inspired me with this film was this movie called Coming Apart. Um, it's um, a movie from the late sixties directed by Milton Moses Ginsburg and stars Rip Torn. And it's oh, really? about- yeah, it's about this psychiatrist and he has um, this camera in his apartment that's taping his sessions and he has his sessions in his apartment. And also like these women are coming over and visiting him and there's like his ex-wife and his girlfriend and like another random girls. And um, he's sleeping with all of them and his patients and only he knows that he's taping them. And so he's, you know, he's having this breakdown, but he's also aware that there's this camera watching him that he's put there and he's kind of, everything has this level of dramatic irony because he knows he's being taped and the women don't. And so he has this kind of divided consciousness and it, mm. it comes out in his performance as well, where it's like he's speaking for not just for the person that he's talking to, not just for the camera, but whoever is watching the footage in the future, you know, like a cop or a lawyer, who, whatever he's going to do, you know? Whoa, I've never heard of that movie. I'm gonna have to check that out. That is really, that sounds really interesting and terrifying, but also really good. Um, actually, that, that reminds me that your film reminded me of the Poughkeepsie tapes, if you've ever seen the Poughkeepsie tapes. No, I, I think I've heard of it, but yeah, I haven't seen no, it. Mostly because you have some, like, especially the shot where you're like, you're creeping behind the couch and pouring into her tea, like having that killer POV was mm -hmm. so creepy in a really awesome way. And I also got American Psycho vibes, like millennial, <laughs> a little bit of American Psycho vibes as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I love American Psycho. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's a great movie. And, and it's like also a great example of like a character where it's somebody who's not, you know, somebody that you particularly like like as a person, but you love watching them and, uh, you know, their, their relatability or likability is superseded by their transgressiveness. Yeah. I think being transgressive is way more better than being likable anytime. I would agree with that. <laughs> well, Julian, thank you so much for talking to me about I Blame Society and yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for, for chatting about I Blame Society. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. <laughs>